All right. Um, Shalom, Yeshua, welcome, and giving all praise and glory to the Most High Power of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, I have an interesting uh, topic that I want to bring to Yeshua today. You know, they say you want to keep something from us, you put it where? In a book. So, I want to uh, share something with you. I want to share something with you. It's called How to Deal with White People. During our time of crisis right now, I think it's very interesting to bring this out. A quick, easy to read handbook. It's called How to Deal with White People by David Goldberg. So let's look and see what's in this book that can benefit us. So that's what it is about. So it's a chapter one, a brief history of white people. Now this is from a Jewish cat by the name of David Goldberg. Say Caucasians come from damp and cold Europe. Cold means you stay indoors, avoiding sunlight. Little sunlight means lack of vitamin A, which affects bone growth and mold and mood. Imagine living in these conditions over thousands of years. Would one be social or pleasant and accepting of others? Now consider the Black Plague arriving from the East. The plague forced white people from their homes, sent them west in search of more suitable lands. But the only problem is Western Europe ends in water, the Atlantic Ocean. Thus began the most pivotal event in world history, the European expansion. In search of resources and land, white people sailed all over the world. They went to Asia, Africa, Australia, Alaska, South America, North America, Indian, everywhere. And the people of these new lands or new worlds welcomed them obviously, obliviously, to the grave mistake that they were making. White people arrived, they claimed the lands and the resources, they told the people of these lands, if you're not white, you're not right. How else are the Dutch at the bottom of the African continent claiming to be Africans? If nothing's wrong with that, then where is the African country in Amsterdam or Belgium? Identifying whites by name. There are all types of whites spread throughout the globe. The ethnicities can vary. To distinguish, let's examine a few last names. Some say if the surname ends in a vowel, then that's Italian. Maggiano, Ramono, etc. Some of these, some of the things Italians are known for are fine clothing, automobiles, and food. To identify Irish, look for last names with an MC or Mick, or an O, as in McCormick or O'Brien. These are several others. Excuse me, there are several others. How will you will find that many police and firemen are Irish? Geographically, Ireland is not strategically positioned to benefit from the maritime exports of its neighboring countries. Therefore, some Irish endure a little more hardships than other whites. Also, if and when a non-white encounters an Irish police officer, this frustration will be exacted upon that person of color. Once again, also if and when a non-white encounters an Irish police officer, this frustration will be exacted upon that person of color. To help you place Jewish people by name, look for names that have, an, have the IE in them, such as Wines. Fine, Stein, or Lib. You can also take note of names with Berg <coughs> or Man <coughs> at the end, like Brockman, Gorman, 
gold, or silver. Jewish people are very important to understanding the current state of the world. I read it again. Jewish people are very important to understanding the current state of the world. <clears throat> it is in your absolute best interest to learn as much as you can about them. From surname variations to the influence they wield. wield. Money, banking, entertainment, information. These are all industries that are controlled and run by Jewish people. You can get nothing done in this world without being Jewish approved. Take it from a Jewish kid. He himself. There are many other ethnicities to help you identify whites by surname. Polish, Russian, Norwegian, Armenian, etc. This is just an overview. It benefits you to know exactly what type of white person you are dealing with and the ethnicity that they claim. Always remember, however, that no matter which way you slice it, they are all still white. White supremacy. Whites have always maintained an air of superiority. <clears throat> but here is an actual fact. The phenotypes, white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes are the weakest. The recessive. Recessive means opposite of dominant, as in weak. Weak is not superior. The white gene is the weakest, recessive. Do note, however, that it is very important that throughout time, white people have and must continue to project an image of superiority in order to mislead non-whites. This is done by repetition through media saturation. The white image must be force-fed over and over to drive a false sense of superiority or supremacy home because by nature whites are not superior. So when Caucasians call you a nigger, a spink, a chink, a wetback, a beaner, you call them a recessive. They know exactly what the term means. Or for added amusement, reverse the insult and call them the nigger. But they were the ones that taught the word and behavior in the first place. A common hostility. Rule number one, whites will steal your land and pretend they are entitled to it. People of color the world over are all in the same predicament. They have all been exploited by one singular group, white people. Globally, from Australia to Alaska and everywhere in between, people of color are on the receiving end of hostility from whites. It's a uniform constant. For instance, before white people came to India, Africa, and Brazil, there was no AIDS. White people came, AIDS came, end of story. Or take another example. In the years 1884 to 1885, white men from Europe banded together and decided how to carve up and divide Africa amongst themselves without any input from a soul in Africa. This is called the Berlin Convention. To put this in proper perspective, imagine you are in your home relaxing. But unknowingly to you, another group of men are deciding how to divide up your home and property without so much as even discussing it with you. Whites have done this to people of color on their home continents all over the world. This vital part of white people's history is instrumental in understanding racial relations between Caucasian and non-whites. To add further insult to the injury, you will notice that whites refer to people of color as minorities, when in actuality it is and always has been them that are the true minorities. There are not there are more non-white people of there are no there are more non-white people of color on this planet than Caucasians. White people are the only minorities. Feel free to refer to them as such. 
dwelling in the past. Just a moment. Be right back with you. All right, we're back. Dwelling in the past. Or have you heard this before? Oh, what's done is done. You people need to get, just get over it. Just let it go. Gosh, you're dwelling in the past. Or let's move forward. Discussing history is always a progressive step in a forward direction. Since history is the best metric for measuring future trends, then the survival of people of color will depend upon their Reevaluation of their interactions with whites. History is known to naturally repeat itself. It's imperative that non-whites take a long, hard look at the history of white folk. Everyone considers history, banks, jobs, schools. Now suddenly, people of color should disregard the history of whites. Perhaps not. The only age whites have allowing them to dominate non-whites in a world where Caucasians are the true minorities is information. As people of color become more informed and begin to understand the nature and the history of whites, the exploitation of people of color will grind to a halt and the playing field will begin to even out. Chapter 2, Understanding White People. There is a delicate balance that you'll maintain in dealing with whites when your words and mannerisms reflect a solid education and awareness of the current real state of race relations. You'll also exclude a calm confidence when you can predict the actions of whites based on the knowledge of their past. One of the best ways to deal with white people is to have a thorough working knowledge of their habits and motivations. True, whites did quite a number on people of color. This must be acknowledged. But it's equally important that a few typical misconceptions regarding racism are cleared up. First off, no energy should be spent trying to reform that which despises you. Never ever. Whites don't despise you because you're dark. They don't despise you because your neighborhood is bad or because you can't read good. They don't discriminate against you because your car isn't registered and you don't have a license. They don't despise you because you don't own any real estate but you bought some new sneakers. They don't hate you because you have thick hair or a wide nose or because you're not educated or because you use double negatives. They hate you just because. Just because you're not white. It's that simple. Waste that energy on those who despise you, whether through attempts at changing them or yourselves. Your accomplishments do not alter their view of you. None of these reasons contributed to their hatred from the onset. Understand that there have to be laws enacted to force Caucasians to respect people that are non-white. Think about it. A law 
This suggests that respect for people of color does not occur naturally in whites. It's pointless to waste energy being upset with them for their nature. Accept white people for what they have shown you they are and not what you want them to be. Rejection of difference. It is only fair to consider how thousands of years of living in harsh conditions could affect Caucasians, thus contributing to an incessant fear of everything. This fear is often manifested as revulsion when they reject anyone different from themselves. Whites are different and tolerant. In other words, difference in any form is not, has not, and will not be accepted by them. We built this country. Imagine you own a company called Unitron Corporation. You have a 200 floor skyscraper downtown with your mic microchips in every cell phone. You are a gazillionaire. In fact, the people on printed money actually look like you and are not white. Are the janitors and mailroom clerks that work in your skyscraper entitled to the same stock options as you and your shareholders? You came up with the plan. They are just the grunts. This is the white's perspective on people of color who have either toiled in slavery or slave-like labor. You are entitled to nothing. You are more than expendable. You are just cogs in their grand sinking. Even poor whites who are not connected to this grand scheme, whites who may come from poor families will always treat you like you are dirt and they are of royal blood. This is because you are as your people are. The image of whites is communicated as success and material wealth. That is why so many rappers appear foolish boasting their money and riches when people the world over with their skin complexions are poor. The richest people of color will always be mistreated by whites because in white people's mind, only people with white skin run the world. Getting familiar. Understanding whites requires familiar, familiarization through general observations. Let's examine a few. Over time, you will notice more. Whites will push you as far as possible until you stop them. They will not stop themselves. It's up to you to create boundaries early and often. For instance, whites will discover sudden surges of courage when accompanied by a medium to large sized dog, whereas they would not so much as make eye contact with a person of color when alone. Accompanied by a dog, they will be bold and even more offensive. To counter this, always level your attention with the white person that owns the dog. Do not smile or laugh. Don't focus on the dog. Avoid interacting with the dog owner until they are without canine. Never let white people stand behind you. No matter what they say, whites are constantly examining, watching, and scrutinizing you. As soon as you sense someone white standing behind you, turn around immediately and look them in the eyes. They will excuse themselves and give you your space. Standing behind you affords them the opportunity to tip com confrontational eyes to their favor. Caucasians can only operate with an unfair advantage, like white person plus a dog or white person plus a position of power or white person plus standing behind you or white person plus standing sitting high on a horse or pickup truck or white person plus 12 to 15 of his cohorts setting a home on fire 
in the dead of the night while women and children sleep. And make no mistake, Caucasians will find zero shame in claiming a victory from these uneven odds. Disconnected. The drum is the life force of people of color. All non-white people have drums in their music. The Aborigines, Indonesians, Asians, East Indians, Africans, North, South, and African Americans, they all need music that they can feel. That's why the bass drum is central. White people have drums or any kind of bass because you can feel bass. And white people don't like to feel anything. So they de emphasize the drums or bass in their music, only leaving you with what you can hear, not what you can feel. With strings, guitars, violins, you can hear those, but you can't feel them. Caucasians don't want experiences that can be felt. For whites, experiences that evoke small, disconnected responses are best. To further understand whites, use the drum example in addition to the colossus displayed during the European expansion to note how they are not connected to the rest of the people on, on the planet. Whites not only display a total disregard for people of color, but their disdain also applies to all other life and eco ec ecological systems on the planet. As well, from wildlife to oceans to rainforest and everything in between. There has never been a time when white people have gotten along fine with people of color or anything else on the planet. Never. They have always been disconnected. This natural disconnection forces whites to emphasize a strong focus on self-created eternal, excuse me, external objects and systems like money, cars, gadgets, iPhones, iPods, watches, GPS navigation systems, laptops, everything that is unnatural and synthetic or outside of oneself. This is why most interactions with whites re revolve around the same thing. How can I make you feel as uncomfortable, afraid, and disconnected as I am? White people are always paranoid and on edge and they will try their hardest to make you experience the same levels of anxiety that they feel one of the biggest solutions to dealing with whites is to know them know them inside and out then you can predict their actions in the meantime however you are better suited to be proactive with white people so for best results we mistreat them first before they have a chance to mistreat you <laughs> The great race debate, no such thing. There is no great race debate. Whites will never discuss race honestly, openly, and fairly. In fact, there would not even be such a thing as race if it were not for whites. They have made the difference in cultures a competition. They don't call it a race for nothing. Whites will only include non-whites when it's time to cast blame or if aliens come to visit in a sci-fi story. Suddenly, humans or man are poisoning the earth together or all of us are destroying the planet. But when it's time to go amass some wealth, only the white people are allowed to go. Or when a person of color wanted to get a job, white people pretend not to see them. Or if a Latino woman wanted to have a baby in a white hospital, they acted like she was dirty. But when it's time to cast blame and discuss the ills of the world, now it's us. As far as white people are concerned, it never has been an us. Consider this. 
Everyone that ever tried to help people of color or even fought in great racial debates has been killed. Read that again. Consider this. Everyone that ever tried to help people of color or ever fought in great racial debates has been killed. Not just silenced or paid off, but killed. Think about that. That sends a strong message to any non-white who might be thinking along the lines of people of color. Let's all come together. Let's unite. Just knowing that they killed every one of the non-white leaders that stood up for equal rights is equal to terrorism, non-whites into conformity. But it's important to understand one truth. Whites are more afraid of you than you should ever be of them. So, go on and unite. Because everything about whites is not only disconnected from non-whites, it's nearly opposite of the rest of the world, even down to the way you must communicate with them. Chapter 3, Communicating with White People. If you decode or translate everything that Caucasians say and refilter it through a racist bigot standpoint, then you will have a better understanding of the true meanings of their words and intentions. With the exception of rhythm, dance, and drums, whites understand all methods of communication, whether spoken or nonverbal. Jungle law. White people pretend to think that people of color are primitive natives. Although it has always been whites that have exhibited the true animalistic behavior. So, if Caucasians interact with people of color as if they are animals, then the primary form of nonverbal communication with white people should be rooted in savory. But this is the language they understand. Bearing this in mind, occasionally, you may have to yell at white people. You are going to have to stare them down so that they respect your space. Maybe even bump into them when passing on the street. Never make the mistake of talking to whites about racism. They know everything regarding the subject forward and backwards. Laws of self-preservation don't allow them to be honest in race-related conversations anyway. It's difficult for them to have a discussion that sheds light on the crimes of their race. They may try to over intellectualize it or just flat out lie. Save yourself the hassle. They only feign ignorance to pick your brain, using your opinions as amusement to, to entertain themselves. Treating you like a kid, recounting a story that they already know the ending to. And just as in the wild, never say thank you to white people and never apologize. It will only be exploited as a sign of weakness or being passive. If you feel the urge to say thanks, just say cool. Hmm. Jungle law serves to avoid unnecessary aggravations until you are faced with no other choice but to actually speak with whites. We need to talk. Now since a face-to-face -face conversation is more real, more human, more connecting, whites will try their best to avoid these interactions, only to replace them with letters, emails, text messages, and maybe a phone call. When you do find yourself in conversation with whites, you are often forced to speak to them in an almost robotic, inhuman inhumane manner. <laughs> the reason you can't speak to white people in your natural tone is because they think it's their job to constantly correct you, scold you, and straighten you out. And their favorite thing to correct is your English. They'll always treat you like even you don't know what you're saying. So, the right way to talk to them is to raise your voice and almost yell at them when speaking. First, when you speak to them naturally, even though they hear you, they'll pretend not to understand you. All things considered, the single most effective method of speaking with whites, however, is to broaden your vocabulary. How? Read plenty of fiction that does not get marketed to your ethnic group. 
In other words, blaze through the novel's white screen. Just a few here and there. A broad vocabulary is essential for speaking with white people. It allows you to understand the language they speak, even if you choose not to speak it yourself on a regular day-to-day -day basis. When you speak to white people in an articulate, intelligent manner, sometimes they'll be shocked because they expect you to speak foolishly or to fulfill a stereotype that they created. In verbal exchanges with Caucasians, you will note that they will always answer your questions with a question. That's how you flip the, converse, the control of the conversation. It's a way of establishing false dominance, a way of reshifting subservience and control, which are two things paramount to white people. There are many reasons white people will ask you to re repeat yourselves. White people feel that when speaking to someone of color, they should be addressed through some sort of medium as if a person of color does not have the right to speak to them directly. So, with irritation, they will ask you to repeat yourself. White people would like to be addressed in a submissive tone when being spoken to by non-whites. So, asking you to repeat yourself is giving you a second chance, a chance to be submissive. In conversation, there are different ways to deal with white people when they ask you to repeat yourself unnecessarily. There is the proactive approach. Raise your voice a notch or two when speaking. Lock in your eyes with theirs in a cold, deaf stare. This might cause some whites to cry at first, but they won't have the chance to ask you to repeat yourself. There is the reactive reproach. You can ignore them when they ask you to repeat yourself and they will magically repeat your words. And of course, the offensive approach in placing of repeating yourself, you mutter something like to bow or dialogue a few notches below your speaking voice and whites will gaps. Know that white people will use many other tactics to show disrespect during the conversation. For instance, they will talk without looking at you. Ignore them with this or delay your response until they acknowledge you. They hate it if you have or assume that you have equal leverage with them in a conversation. Whites have no problem approaching you and assuming their authoritative tone. When this occurs for amusement and your clear speaking voice respond with, I don't speak English. The irony and humor of that statement should keep your mood upbeat until you are forced into your next encounter with a white person. Chapter 4. White people in the workplace. Understand this. Two things. Number one, the office is white people's turf. Number two, if you are not white, every day at the office is your first day on the job. Doesn't matter. If you've been there for 30 years, it's still your first day. And you will be treated as such with a minimal respect given to someone who must be new. Now, since the office is white people's turf, then on this turf, they'll feel courageous, brazen, daring, more comfy. And they're most comfortable behind a desk and in front of a computer with a cup of coffee isolated and disconnected from all other all other life. People of color only function in this hostile environment out of pure necessity. White people assume that non-whites apprehension to being jobless equals a fear of Caucasians. They will reveal in people of color's reluctance to be poor. Misinterpreting this as a fear of respect for the temporary authority whites hold in the office. This is the root of the many mind games whites utilize as they toy with non-whites on the job. The best way to strive in this atmosphere is to enter the workplace and say to them and yourself, I'm not here to play with white people. Go on, try it, try it right now. Say it out loud. I'm not here to play with white people. 
White people think you're here to entertain or play with them. And rest assured, they are definitely going to play with you. So don't be surprised that you will never get that promotion if it's non-white versus a white. Don't bet the bank on it, no matter how well you perform or what your credentials are. Performance review. It's not you. It's not up to you. There is nothing you can do. Your work ethic on the job does not affect white's decision or opinion of you. It doesn't matter how hard you work to try to win over whites, trust, and show them that you are just like them. It's not that white people don't trust you. The truth is they don't intend to give you a chance to perform before because you may excel and surpass them. A steadfast rule to note when dealing with white people in the workplace is cowardice, is professionalism. Now, for best results, with smaller issues on the job, always try to get a face-to-face -face meeting. White people hate real communication. It makes them uncomfortable. Tell them that your email is down. Don't take a call. Just show up at their cubic, cubicle or office. This showing up tactic is usually more effective with my minor inconveniences like obtaining a report, letter, etc. Remember, 80% of success is simply showing up. Remember, 80% of success is simply showing up. Private eyes. At any given time, if you look around, you'll see someone white staring at you like you're on display, like you're a specimen of some sort. Catch them looking and they'll avert their eyes or give you the fake smile, just showing their teeth. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> sometimes you'll notice white people will smile at you for nothing and say hello. This speak and smile tactic is the white way of saying, don't mind me, I'm harmless. But these are the most harmful whites. Remember, when, when, whenever a white person tries to relax you in the workplace, turn your defense up. If it's on the street, just pat yourself down and look for your wallet. <laughs> Everything a white person says to a person of color is the exact opposite of what they really mean. In addition to simply staring at you like you are an exhibit at a museum, white people actually think it's their job to watch and monitor you as a citizen. They like to keep an eye on you just in case you do something that they think is inappropriate. This affords them the opportunity to be the first ones to call the police on you. They feel like they're the cops where there aren't any around. A good hustle. Stress kills. Seriously. For people of color's own health and survival, it is imperative that they alleviate any stimuli in their life that can attribute to stress, like constantly swimming in a shark tank, tickling a rattlesnake repeatedly, crawling through a minefield on your way home, or working with and for whites. Anything that stresses you out will provide to be fatal over time. This is due to the unnaturally high levels of anxiety that you must maintain in order to endure the experience. Therefore, when you absolutely must work with whites, view it as a temporary assignment, even if it has been a long term. Do it only until you can figure a way to get out and work for yourselves or with other people of color. For non-whites, working with and for Caucasians is like hustling in the street. Plan on only doing it temporarily. Attempt to position yourselves where you don't have to work with and for them for an extended period of time. Prolonged exposure to the games white people play in the workplace can be draining and cancerous. You'll sometimes find yourself interacting harshly with people outside of your workplace the same way that whites deal with you on, your, on the job. This is a sign of early stages of the poisoning. Having a job with whites 
should always be perceived as nothing more than a hustle, a temporary assignment, or a temporary arrangement. Chapter 5, police. The police are here to protect and serve rich white people. I'll say it again. The police are here to protect and serve rich white people. When a child reaches the age of 18 or finishes high school, they are expected to leave their parents' home. Normally, those teens, with proper preparation, go on to college. Without college, some will find a job in a clerical position following high school. For most, without the means to pursue further education, they are faced with two options, the military and the police academy. Both organizations need bodies, and they are always hiring. The more adventurous and courageous young adults will select the military, while the lazy and cowardly select the police force. In some rare occasions, a small percentage of these individuals enlist in either institution because they may have relatives that were soldiers or police officers. However, the majority of these individuals are faced with limited alternatives. Since the police decision is the easiest to select between the two, it becomes the final choice for those who are forced to leave their parents' house and get a job. So they become a cop. Understanding this drive is fundamental as you consider the thought process and actions of police. Equally important is recognizing that the police system was created in order to control and terrorize ex-slaves and to also fight the unity of coal miners. This is not a for the people organization. It takes nothing to be a cop. No special skills, no qualifications, nothing. Cops are not required to have a thorough social educational background or a criminal justice degree. Being a cop is not a service police performed out of the goodness of their hearts. Being a cop is not a service police perform out of the goodness of their hearts. It's a paycheck. They do it, they do it to get paid. Getting paid requires good performance. To be considered a, for a good performance, a cop must make more arrests. This foundation creates a natural, ongoing conflict of interest between people of color and police. Every time a non-white interact with a cop, the officer is endeavoring to arrest that person of color. Loose lips sink ships. Don't talk to police. When interacting with police, remember that they are always, always trying to figure out a way to arrest you. Never talk to police. Minimize interaction with them. Occasionally, you may find yourself pulled over for DNW, driving non-white violation, a so-called routine traffic stop. The only thing routine about it is the consistent harassment that the police system has been known for. In any event, if you find yourself stopped by a police officer, remember that you are smarter than a cop. They settled on that job because they couldn't do anything else. Don't let them fool or trick you during this inexperience, inconvenience. The entire justice system is distorted from the roots. But